This is the story of how canals changed and shaped our modern world. Carrying huge volumes of goods and fuel, they were a stimulus to Britain's great industrial revolution. But they also gave us much more, and their legacy lives on, often in surprising ways. I'm Liz McIver. I've spent my life studying and talking about history. I believe it's time to take a different look at our inland waterways. Connecting the industrial powerhouses of Yorkshire and Lancashire meant driving through the Pennines, a huge obstacle with difficult geography and climate. Would men with a fledgling knowledge of engineering be able to conquer the unforgiving terrain and fickle weather? Whose reputations would be enhanced and whose would crumble? And how did their pioneering work give rise to a new discipline, civil engineering? the backbone of England, in places 2,000 feet high, a rugged and almost inaccessible natural barrier. To build a canal here would take imagination and brute strength. But the prize was enormous, a trade link between Yorkshire and Lancashire, an industrial corridor between Leeds and Liverpool. If the canal could be built, it would enable the wool merchants of Bradford, Wakefield and Leeds to send their products across the Pennines to Liverpool and beyond to the British Empire. In the West, traders in Liverpool could transport imported American cotton to the mill towns of Lancashire. And in the middle, a giant coal field would provide the fuel for the Industrial Revolution. If there was an imperative to improve communication in the late 18th century, it was this, the state of the roads. They were unpaved and unpassable in some places. This is Eastergate Packhorse Bridge on a track known as Rates Highway, linking Combe Valley to Rochdale. Travel on these roads would have been hazardous at the best of times. Only small amounts of merchandise could be moved at one time, and the cost was prohibitive. It was as cheap to carry freight on a ship from Portugal as it was to take it a few hundred miles by road across England. Everyone agreed that a Trans-Pennine Canal would be the ideal solution. In a move destined to make life tricky, two committees were set up, one in Yorkshire, the other in Lancashire. The Yorkshire side was much keener than Lancashire to press on. The cities of Bradford, Wakefield and Leeds were well established as woollen centres. They wanted the quickest route across the hills to Liverpool and the international markets beyond. Their option would run from Leeds north to Skipton and west towards Preston and south into Liverpool. They knew a canal was a long-term project that would help businesses grow as it developed. But they had a much more urgent problem, which the canal could resolve quickly. This is what it was all about, limestone. And this is the reason that so many canals were built in the north of England. Now you might wonder, you know, why do we need lime? And it was burnt using coal to make a fertiliser for improving the land. Lime kilns were used to burn the rock at about 1,000 degrees Celsius. Quarries near Bradford were running out of limestone but fresh supplies had been found further north, near Skipton. 
the canal would be the ideal way of transporting it. The Yorkshire industrialists wanted work to start at their end. Asking two committees, each with a vested interest, to decide on a route was never going to be smooth. Predictably, the Liverpool backers weren't interested in going as far north as Preston or in limestone. They wanted coal. As Yorkshire mulled over its preferred route, Liverpool produced an alternative. It would take the canal through Wigan and the Lancashire coalfield, then on to the market towns of Blackburn and Burnley that were just starting to expand. Both committees realised that someone would have to make an expert and independent judgement on the two routes. So they called in the best known engineer of his time, James Brindley. Brindley was no academic. He couldn't spell and his writings were almost illegible. But he was a born engineer with a curious mind, a pile of common sense and a willingness to experiment. He's widely credited as the designer of the Bridgewater, often regarded as the first modern canal in Britain. In the late 18th century, if you used the term engineer, people would have assumed you meant a soldier because engineering was the preserve of the military. James Brindley was in the vanguard of a new breed of self-educated men who'd started to develop civilian engineering. The engineers were defying their profession Firstly, because they worked for a daily fee rather than for the work which was actually done. They were the equals in the professional sense of the people who employed them, whereas previously engineers tended to be the servants of those who employed them. And they prepared designs and specifications for other people to do the work according to the designs which they had made. Brindley had to overcome a fundamental challenge, how to keep canals watertight. The answer he came up with, and for some it was his greatest achievement, was puddling, a technique for lining the base of the canal with impervious clay. This is a puddle clay out of the quarry, half dug, and this is to go on, the, on a firm base at the bottom of the canal and it's got to be trampled in, as so. And, and when you get to the wetter stuff, oh, it, right, yes. when you've wetted it down, it goes together that much better. Yes, I can feel the difference already. And that seals it off. Gosh, it's really hard work, isn't it? Yes, well, that's the reason they use sheep or cattle to do it on the larger areas, but man has to do it on the small, narrow areas. And puddle clay is a perfect clay that doesn't break up in water. So you can build it on it, you can build the banks, the bottom, it'll never leak. It, it's so fine, but it's the only clay that doesn't break up in water. So it has to be puddle clay, up to spec. Brindley arbitrated between Lancashire and Yorkshire and selected what he believed was the best route for the canal it would follow Yorkshire's northern line because it was cheaper. To appease the Liverpool wishes, a spur would connect the coal fields around Wigan. It finally ended the friction between the two counties. Both sides agreed in 1770 that work should start simultaneously at both ends. In designing canals, Brindley knew that following the contours of the land would make for easier construction it avoided the need for difficult and expensive tunnels, embankments and locks. James Brindley favoured the contour method, basically because he didn't have to worry about locks and every time a lock was used, there'd be water used and with any lot, any canal, really speaking, one of the biggest problems is maintaining a supply of water. So you need to keep as much water in the canal as possible. And he did that by following the contour and not by using locks. The contouring is evident at Greenberfield as Brindley curved the canal around the lie of the land. 
It's a very elegant engineering solution, and today we can appreciate how it enhances the beauty of the landscape. But all this meandering added time to the journey, and contouring couldn't solve all the problems in trying to cross England's highest range of hills. At some point, you had to tackle the topography head on. Between Bradford and Keithley, there were two major problems facing the canal builders. The first, at Dowley Gap, was how to cross the River Eyre, carrying water off the central Pennines. Brindley designed an aqueduct with seven arches. It's the biggest structure on the canal and spans the air 30 feet below. The aqueduct was built by stonemasons and navvies, wielding only picks, shovels, buckets and wheelbarrows. Brindley died before it opened in 1773. The second problem with the terrain was at Bingley. With Brindley's death, it fell on the shoulders of a young engineer from Halifax called John Longbotham. And it was Longbotham who came up with one of the most spectacular engineering solutions in canal history. Bingley, the canal had to rise a total of 90 feet. Longbotham designed a system that would allow boats to be raised or lowered in separate stages. They're the steepest staircase locks in the UK, with a gradient of about one in five. It also boasts the tallest lock gates in the country, but it's a complicated and not very efficient system. It takes about an hour for a boat to pass through. They're really an example of the old fashioned type of engineering that was used in the early part of the 18th century. After they'd constructed them, they realised there were problems because of the amount of water you can use. You can hear it yeah. pouring down now. And they're, they're quite inefficient. And so very, very quickly, they had to go on and develop better ways of using them, and they, they built single locks instead. The canal's engineers were taking on the landscape and winning, but they knew that getting the route across a gentle hill would be relatively simple. As they progressed west into Lancashire and higher into the hills, much bigger challenges would await. This is Fall Ridge the summit of the Leeds and Liverpool Canal, nearly 500 feet above sea level. It's a peaceful and beautiful place, within sight of the moorland that so inspired the Bronte sisters. But two centuries ago, the noise here would have been deafening, bustling with navvies hammering rocks, horses pulling carts and explosions going off in the hills. Again, the Pennine geography was making life difficult for the engineers. Here, Plans for locks were abandoned in favour of a much more ambitious structure, a tunnel stretching almost a mile. Foleridge will become the single most expensive part of the entire construction project. The engineer, Robert Whitworth, had worked as a surveyor and draftsman for Brindley's organisation. The technique Whitworth employed became known as cut and cover and is still in use today. Cut and cover was actually used about 4,000 years ago in Babylon, where they used exactly the same technique of digging a trench, building a brick uh, work arch, although it was made of different materials, and then covered it up with earth. Cut and cover consists of a big trench that you dig on the ground, then you build your 
lining, your tunnel lining, which uh, normally has a circular or arch shape, and there you fill it up with the ground that you've excavated previously, so you leave the ground surface as if nothing happened. They had to be really careful and control the way they were backfilling that tunnel to make sure that there was no asymmetric loading that would cause collapse of the tunnel lining. The work was dangerous, slow and difficult. Collapses were common and when the navvies reached the central section, they found the rock so challenging they gave up and cut and cover. They were faced with laboriously boring through with picks and shovels. It took five years to complete. Navy work was very dangerous. If you have a compound fracture, you know, a fracture where the bone is broken and the skin is broken, you'll go to hospital and essentially they'll probably amputate the limb because your chances of it healing up are very low. In those circumstances, if you're working for a good canal company, they might compensate you because obviously you can't go back and carry on being a Navi and the chances are you will never have skilled work again. The engineers and contractors knew that the smaller they kept the tunnel with, the quicker and cheaper it would be to finish. And that meant they didn't include a towpath by which the horses could pull the boats through. So instead, boatmen had to leg their craft, propelling boats through by walking along the walls of tunnels. At some of the longer tunnels, professional leggers could be hired for the journey. 25 years after construction began, some sections of the Leeds and Liverpool Canal were open, and as a commercial venture, it was working. By 1795, boats were carrying wool, grain, cotton and limestone. New companies wanted a share in the success. Before the Folridge Tunnel was completed, work started on two new canals across the Pennines, but these would be shorter and more direct. The first was the Rochdale Canal, engineered by William Jessop. It would run from Rochdale to Sowerby Bridge near Halifax. It was only 32 miles long, but needed 92 locks to cross the hills. At the same time as the Rochdale Canal was started, an even shorter crossing was proposed. The Huddersfield Narrow Canal would start in Ashton-under-Lyne and run for just 20 miles. This one was in the hands of the engineer, Benjamin Utram. His plan was so bold, it verged on being reckless. He wanted to build the longest and highest canal tunnel in Britain, the Stanage Tunnel. And this pursuit of the ultimate shortcut would push the boundaries of what was technically possible at the time. This is Pule Hill, 1,300 feet above sea level, on bleak Marsden Moor, and midway between Manchester and Leeds. Utram had decided he could burrow straight through here for over three miles and complete the entire canal in just five years. His problems began with the layout of the tunnel. Stanage Tunnel is down there, about 600 feet below the surface, when Utram arrived here, he was faced with the immediate problems of the remoteness of the site, a climate that would swing wildly in the seasons, and a very limited knowledge of what lay beneath his feet. When Utram visited the area, he had no idea about what kind of rock was at depth. And so when the tunnel had started cutting, they cut through the shale, but then encountered an ancient fault that had thrown up the gritstone in their path and they had to drill and blast their way through it. The work was painfully slow, hampered by poor workmanship, interference from the canal company and lack of money. The tunnel was hacked out by pick or blasted with black powder, an early form of explosive. In one year, just 150 yards was excavated. Okay. 
The use of black powder was extremely dangerous. The explosive power was low and unpredictable. It would be another 75 years before the stable and much more powerful dynamite was invented. There were no safety fuses. Instead, navvies would stuff gunpowder into goose quills, light them and hope they burnt at the right speed. Once the fuse was lit, the navvies clung to a rope, one above the other, and were hauled up the shaft. After the explosion, they were lowered back down to clear up the broken rock. Accidents happened when they simply weren't hauled high enough above the danger zone. It's thought that during construction, 50 men were killed. Ultima was really too ambitious because this involved major engineering works without really the engineering skills. Um, that, he, that had been developed on other waterways. It was ambitious because it was very hard to estimate the costs and actually very hard to estimate the kind of returns that might be involved. The canal really was a product of the canal mania, excessive investment in the kind of um, projects that might well make no money at all. The engineer, Benjamin Utram, resigned after seven years on the project. To sort out the mess, the canal company now brought in an engineer regarded as one of the greatest of his generation. Thomas Telford was a meticulous Scotsman who had worked across the country. He was a master in building canals, castles, churches, harbours, bridges and roads. Engineers like Telford were now professional consultants giving independent advice to clients rather than being employees. And he used trusted contractors to ensure consistency. His was a more sophisticated approach and he was taking advantage of the progress engineering had made. Telford no longer had to follow the contours of the land as his predecessors had. He met his challenges head on, driving through hills in giant cuttings and straddling the valleys with large embankments. Telford re-surveyed Stanage and found enormous errors. The tunnel ends were at different heights and the central alignment was off by three feet. By following his instructions, the company finally managed to complete the construction. But even then, the problems at Stanage weren't over as one of the supply reservoirs failed. 70 million gallons of water came crashing down the moors, sweeping everything away in front of it. And the cascading water scoured peat from the surface. And the Black Flood, as it was called, hurtled through the Colne Valley, wrecking mills and factories. Five people were killed, and a 15-tonne boulder was swept two miles down the hills. Stanage and the Huddersfield Canal had taken 17 years to complete, more than three times the original estimate of Benjamin Utram. And by 1810, some 40 years after it started, the big prize connecting Leeds and Liverpool was almost within reach. In that time, the Industrial Revolution had got into full swing. Business was booming on the sections that were open. And, at Parbold in Lancashire, the canal took a turn into history. Instead of heading north, engineers now took the canal south towards the rich coal seams around Wigan. The canal finally joined up at Wigan in 1816. The building of the canals led to a new scientific understanding about materials, construction and mathematics. 
such big projects with hundreds of men meant there was no longer a place for trial and error. Civil engineering became a discipline that encompassed reliable and accurate estimating of cost, design and the supervision of works. Two years after the opening of the Leeds and Liverpool Canal, the Institution of Civil Engineers was formed in London. First president was Thomas Telford, the man who'd solved the problems at Stanage Tunnel. A central theme of the institution became the sharing and learning from other people's work. The publication of Learned Society papers continues today. It began in 1835 and there's a continuous record to today. We still do that. We still have evening lectures. We still have discussion meetings. We still learn from each other and we still publish our, our findings. And of course we have the additional benefit of the internet today, um, which the early engineers would have been very glad to have. What they were doing in many ways uh, was creating the equivalent of an internet for themselves because the canal network and the road network and then the rail networks were binding networks that improved the means of communication. By 1816, all the difficult geography and climate of the Pennines had been overcome and they'd been crossed by three canals. The Leeds and Liverpool Canal was the region's main transport artery. Along its route sprang cotton mills, factories, iron mills and warehousing. The volume of goods carried by the canal increased rapidly. Wool, grain, timber and passengers were all being transported in bulk and coal remained the most commonly transported cargo. Within a quarter of a century, the Leeds and Liverpool Canal Company had paid off all its debts. And within 50 years, the population of Leeds had trebled. Britain's economy had undergone an explosive expansion, allowing it to become the first industrial power in the world. Engineers who'd focused on small sections of waterways had built a network of canals that changed people's lives forever. The men responsible for the design, layout and execution of the early canals began as self-taught craftsmen. But in profiting by experience, those who followed in their footsteps were recognised as the country's foremost civil engineers. The civil engineers who transformed Britain's landscape have left us with awe-inspiring monuments to a bygone age.